Okay. Finally. Now, I don't know how long we're keeping this room because I put the paperwork in yesterday to transfer us in here, mm -hmm. but who knows what because they're transferring people all over the place. All right. Today is the exciting lecture. Types of data. Well, didn't we all think there's just one type of data, the stuff you collect? But there's there are different different types that we, we're going to look at here. So the first type, we're, we have something called parametric versus static. A parameter is a numerical measurement describing some characteristic of a population. So a parameter, or a parametric one, goes with populations. And a statistic is a numerical It's also a measurement. Describing uh, some characters of the sample. So the easiest way to remember this, you could look at population parameter and a sample statistic. If they, they start with the same letters, easiest way to remember it. So that's the statistic. The course statistics, it's different. The statistics itself is the science of planning experiments. To obtain data. Organize the data. Analyze the data summarize the data.
and interpret the conclusion of the analysis. Okay, these should be all bullet points. Basically, statistics is, when we say statistics, we mean numbers. Well, those numbers come from what? You have to get them from some data, some calculations, some the way of collecting data. So all this stuff breaks down how you get to those numbers. That's the whole process. Let me see where my examples are. Mm -hmm. Okay, parameter statistics. There are 17 million high school students in the United States. In a study of 8,505 high school students, 16 years or older, 45 of them said that they texted while driving at least once in the previous 30 days. Again, the data is based on texting while you're driving in. You have to always tell me where you get the data from. Identify the parameter and the statistics of this example. So, why? It's the overall Yeah, because parameter goes with population. The 17,246,372. Well, that's the population. So the statistic is, yeah, it's 44.5% because that's of the sample. That's the characteristic of the sample. What's the characteristic of the population? Well, they're high school students. That's the characteristic, which are 16 and above. So again, the definitions are very important because when you're asked to find the difference between the, what's the population, what's the sample of the parameter or the statistic, you have to be able to determine what is the characteristic being analyzed. Okay. The next type of data. Quantitative versus qualitative, what your book calls categorical. Have you heard those two words before, quantitative and qualitative? Exactly, yeah, but that's a popular way of using this subject is in the, in the life sciences. So let's look at what those mean. What do you think quantitative is? How do you say that? Why do you say that? You're you're right. Because <laughs> what are the five first five letters? What do they sound like? Quantity. So that this type of data, quantitative analysis, deals with numeric values. So this is the statistic of numeric representations.
I'm going to use just the gen generic word measurement instead of all the other things. Because measurement is a very huge term. It doesn't just mean measuring with a tape how big something is or how wide something is. or it's You can measure the number of items. Three men, 13 women. That, that's the measurement of the class. So measurement is a is a quote term saying any any data that I'm using, I'm using as measurement instead of typing of observation or this, 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 this. Uh, qualitative represents the attributes of an object. being measured. Yeah, I'm sorry I didn't send you a reminder because right now people are in like three or four different classes. I'm still putting them into one class to send. So I will do that. That's on my list to do. It's getting bigger every day. So what do, we, what do we mean by attributes? When we say attributes, what are we talking about? Yes, very good, yes. Yes, those are attributes of, because if you just say the sport itself, basketball, football, soccer, whatever, yeah, those break down. Yes. Which one? If anywhere, it'd be in, in the center. It may be another building. Anybody see that coming in? Ask the police office. It's about 20 feet, 30 feet that way. Sorry about that big. Thank you. Yeah, so now this is a big difference. Quantitative, that's pretty easy. We could do that as long as we have numerical values we can calculate. Uh, we can count for people. We look at test grades. Qualitative, but this one, for example, let's look at test grades only. Let's say test grades are, let's say these are the test grades. We can figure out the average of those and all that sort of stuff. How about that? There's an example of qualitative, is we have something that's not numeric, it's a description, it's an attribute. I got an A in this course, which in this test, which means I got between a 90 and 100. But can you do anything with this? Yes, but how do we figure out what the person's average is gonna be? What is their current grade? Yes. It's called, whenever you deal with qualitative information, it's coded. When you code something, what you're doing there is you're taking the data itself and you're attributing some values to it. So in other words, for the test grades, I can say that since A is the best, that's four points. B is the next, that's three points. Then C, then D, and then F is zero points. Bless you. This is the way that your grades are calculated for your overall, your current grading. Because on a report card, all you see is letter grades. Well, it used to be only, now, they, now, they, now they're giving values of, the reason they do that is to separate who's number one, who's number two, who's number three in the class, in, this, in the school. Because if everybody gets A's, who's the number one student? It's the person who had the highest grades in the A's, mid hundreds instead of mid nines. So, up until then, they assigned this. So 
we can add up all these one, two, three, four, five, six. Let's, let's make it only five. Let's see this person's average. What is their current grade? So this is a four pointer. This is a four pointer. This is a three, a two, and a one. So it's 14. How do we find their average? So 14 divided by five. Five goes into 14 twice. Five goes into 48 times. So they have a 2.8, which is what about, what is their current grade then? What letter grade? Well, 2.0 is C, 3.0 is a B, so it's a C plus. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> That's a good question. <laughs> um, no, it's not the law of mathematics. There's, no, it's, there are certain laws like the laws of large numbers and things like that, but the rounding is a man made endeavor to just to help people with that is, well, it helps us because if, if we're dealing with money, can you have this? How, well, in, in money, what, is, what do these numbers represent? Cash, that's dollars. This one, that's dimes. This is a cents. Is there anything lower than cents? No. So that's when you would round, round up. Yes, sir. No, it's a, it's Dallas College math course. No. no. Dang, that we got caught. <laughs> so actually, you guys do this every time you go to a gas station. If you look at the gas prices, it's like three twenty nine nine. The reason they do the reason they do that is all psychological. Which price looks cheaper? Because this number is smaller than this number, even though it's one one thousandth of a penny. It's all psychological. You, you go to stores and shopping, you'll always see stuff fourteen ninety nine. Mm -hmm. Why? Just put the last sentence of it. It's all psychological. You're actually paying 15 bucks for it. So, so it's, yeah, it's, it's more stuff that people lie to you about. Uh, let's see here. Oh, yeah. Units. What are units? Yeah. Grams, ounces. Uh, that's not a unit. That's an individual object. But we, why is this important? And I'll show you an example in a second. Yeah. Very important cooking. Actually, I made a mistake yesterday. I was making hummus. And instead of reading... <laughs> I put one tablespoon of salt instead of one teaspoon of salt. Guess what my food tasted like? <laughs> I ate the ocean. <laughs> so units are very important. Because that way, now here's an example of real world example of why units are important. NASA lost a $125 million Mars Climate Explorer when it crashed because the controlling software had acceleration data in English units instead of metrics. So think of that. And that's happened a lot. Uh, in military-wise, in the 60s, there was an invasion on Cuba called the Bay of Pigs invasion. I don't know if any of you heard of that. What that was is we were going to attack the communist forces in Cuba. But the thing about it is there are different time zones. 
Florida and Cuba are two different time zones. That was not taken into consideration when they attacked. So the attack happened when there was no support, which happens a lot in international warfare. So yeah, dealing with units is super, 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 super important. Okay, uh, qualitative data, let's look at this. Well, let me see, I'll use this. Quantitative, okay, instead of categorical, I use the qualitative, but again, they're the same thing. A quantitative data refers to ages. For, this is an example. Why is that important? How is that a quantitative data if deal with ages? Yeah, we, we, you can find an average. You could do mathematics with them. Categorical, categorical or uh, labels, genders, male, female. They're attributes of an object you're studying. Categorical data as numbers. I gave you the example about grades. You take the stuff that's just words and you put numbers numbers to them, assign numbers to them. If you ever took a survey, you did that. Yeah. A Likert scale survey. This is an example of a Likert like scale. I quantify somebody's opinions of an object or of a question. Uh, do you brush your teeth before going to bed? Do you brush your teeth in the morning? Ask this. You notice when you do surveys, never, ever, ever have the person put their name or any type of in distinguishing information on there. It's illegal. Whenever you do surveys, it has to be 100% anonymous. It just has to count. If you have 100 people that you're surveying, you have to have 100 sheets or 100 responses. But you can never have any type of inf information that can point somebody to a specific survey. The, the moment you do that, you can go to jail. So. All right, so that's an example of uh quantitative and qualitative now we have another type discrete versus continuous what do you think those mean <laughs> you're right <laughs> well, we're thinking of mathematically <laughs> yeah, I'm going to give you a secret number. Calculate it. No, no, so no. It, it, it's, 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 a, it's a weird word to use discrete because we use it we not something else. The, the difference of the two are these. Discrete data is quantitative data. Aren't numbers that are finite or countable? That's discrete. It's finite or countable. It has an end. If I ask you to count the one to 10, you go one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, 10, then it's done, it's done. Yeah, finite means it has an end. 
or countable. So continuous would just be opposite. This is an infinite number of possible data values. Can you think of examples of what the difference of these two really are in the real world? Discrete versus continuous. It is continuous. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, your debt is continuous, yes. Would you say Yeah. Would it be like, like a life expectancy? No, because even at that, you're looking at basically continuous data has decimals. Discrete data does not have decimals. Is that right? Discrete data does not have decimals. Continuous has decimals. I can even go further and say, there's, yeah, so. We could look at this as just numbers, integers, and everything else. In other words, what I'm saying here is we said it's infinite, right? Between zero and one, how many numbers are there? Infinite numbers. There's a theorem in mathematics called the Bolzano Weierstrass theorem. It says that if you give me any two numbers, I could divide those two numbers in half, I'll get a number. Now I can take those two numbers and divide those two in half, I'll get a number. I'll take those two numbers and divide them in half. I can never stop doing that. That's infinity. There are an infinite number of subdivisions possible. That's what a continuous data is. So in the real world example would be a uh, digital or a thermometer. Thermometer. What what would be a discrete thermometer? Anybody use thermometers anymore? <laughs> As opposed. To... <laughs> uh, oh, the head, the forehead's kind of this. No, the old ones. You ever use the mercury ones when you have to shake and put in your under your tongue? Is that continuous or is that discrete? The, the data you're looking at. Yeah, because you're looking at a number and that's, that's a number. You, you can't really tell me if it's anything else. Doctors will never say it's 96.735. So in discrete data, you have the numbers and they, they, you can't have decimals between them, but it's, it's finite. A digital thermometer, so this is a traditional And this is digital. Or radios. In the old days, before you guys were ever born, the radios just had these buttons you had to press and it would move the switch over and it and had to be exactly on this line. Nowadays, you have these very fine tuned digital receivers that will pick up any signals anywhere. But those radio signals can be what you see is like 101.1 is actually 101.0159. Some it, it, I mean, it goes to a lot further, they just round it up, make it easier for us. So, anything digital is continuous because there are no ends and decimals. For example, 1.0, we have 1.01, 0.01, 1. 0, 0, 1. 1. Zero, 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 one. So let's look at these examples of bike.
discrete data of the finite type. Each of several physicians plans to count the number of physical examinations given during the next full week. The data are discrete data because they are finite numbers, such as 2746. They're, actually, they're countable. Discrete data that's infinite in type. Casino employees roll a fair die until a number five comes up. Is What's the chance, if you have one die, what's the chance of a five coming up? One out of six. But does that mean that five will ever show up? No. What it says is that if you roll it six times, you should get a five once. But it can be infinite as well. You can roll it forever and ever and ever and never roll a five. Continue to know what when the typical patient has a blood drawn as part of a routine examination, the volume of blood drawn is between zero milliliters and 50 milliliters. Is it exactly 50 milliliters or no? If you ever seen, if you had a tube here in liquids, this is called the meniscus. It's in a tube, this is a tube with, with some liquid in there. It's never a flat line. It's got, because of the atmospheric pressure, it's got a bump in it. Blood on the other hand, will have a bump. So even though it says 50 milliliters here, how much do you really have? <laughs> yeah, you don't know because you don't know how much is in here. You can calculate it. That's what we do in calculus, but that's too much work. So that's why uh, if it goes there, it's good enough for us. Why? Because when you squirt this thing back into another tube, is 100% of the blood gone? No, so there's some part of it after the day is done, everything washes out. So the accuracy is questionable. The accuracy in the words you use. Fewer versus less. Discrete or continuous? Which one's which? Ooh, why? I was thinking because of the continuous. Yeah, I think that, that it, I, yeah, I never thought about going to negatives, but yeah, that could work. What do y'all think? Fewer, is that discrete or continuous? Is it finite or infinite? Is it countable or not countable? as opposed to less. One is exact, the other one's not exact. You were right, but not for that reason. But it was right anyway. If you were in Vegas, it doesn't matter if you're right or wrong, as long as you get money. Because fewer is accountable, not right. How many fewer? If I just say, give me, you know, give me a little bit less. I can say, give me a little bit less. I can't say, give me a little bit fewer. If I do, then I'm asking for a, a, a solid number. Uh, the example that they use in the, in the book. We drank fewer cans of cola. That's the first example. And the second cans is 
we drank less cola. Can we say we drank fewer cola? Well, cola is a liquid. We drank fewer cola, you know, because fewer represents a it refers to numbers. Because in order to have fewer, you have to have some you have to have some number to start off with. So it has to be countable to begin with. So we drank fewer cans of cola. We drank less cola. In other words, what this one is, this one's amount, liquid amount. These are the cans, the physical cans. All right, so you have, you have to be able to, to distinguish between those two and what you're looking for. So with that, with that being said, would the liquid be quantum and the other one be? No, the liquid would be continuous. I'm talking about like if you put it in a, in a perspective where what you had just finished with is describing the quantum and categorical. So, oh, would that be correct? Like the liquid would be the measurement, right? Which would be the quantum, right? And, and the cans would be the, the cans would be the quantity. Mm -hmm. Because they're they're numeric. You can you can you can associate each can with one number. You can assign a number to each can, but can you assign a number to each? amount of cola you drank. You can, if you measure it, ounces, liters, and quarts and grams and stuff like that. But so yeah, so if you're looking at quantitative and qualitative, you know, this would be qualitative and this would be quantitative. This should be qualitative. This would be quantitative. Because quantitatives would put numbers to it. So less and fewer. So looking at levels of measurement. So in order to describe levels of measurements, we have to classify our types of numbers. We have to classify our data values. The words we use here are ordinal, uh, nominal, ratio, and interval. I bet you've heard of two of these. Has anybody heard of ordinal or nominal? No, but we'll talk discuss. It. We know we've heard ratio and we've heard intervals before. Now we're gonna look at the reason why is this important? Knowing the type of data we're using will help us. It, it's used in specific type of experiments that you do. All right, well, let me I'll just go back a little bit. What makes something an experiment as opposed to an observation? So I use the word a lot. I use uh, experiment and observation. What's the difference between the two? There's really only one difference. No. The difference is this an experiment is when you interject something into what you are observing. Is it when, when you put something into the study itself? Think of med medical research. It's an experiment, it's not an observation. It was an experiment because I'm giving you either a medicine or a placebo, a sugar tablet. 
I, I physically am influencing what's going to happen. That's an experiment. An observation is I would sit back and just see what you do. So you start the experiment. I give half the class placebos, half the class medicine, and then I sit back and now I do a observation to see what happens. I take their, their medical records and see what happens to them in the next couple of days. That's called a double blind study. A, when you hear the word double blind study, it means two things. The people taking in the survey, in the, in the experiment themselves, don't know what they're getting. And the people doing the experiment don't know what they're giving. So if medical treatments, those are always double blind studies in which the pharmacy will give these doctors and nurses a bunch of medicine. They can't tell them apart. They'll give them to the patients. So the nurses and doctors don't know what they're getting. They just know it's medicine that's supposed to help this, this, in this malady. And then they give it to their patients who now they take it and then they record what, what, what are the outcomes. Why would you do something like that? Reduce, yeah, if you, it reduces, not eliminate the bias. Because if your friend was in the study and they had cancer and you had, you're testing this miracle cure for cancer, you'd make sure that your friend gets that cancer cure, don't you? You wouldn't give them a sugar tablet. So I mean, it's, it sounds unethical, but it's got to be done that way because you want to make sure 100% of this thing works. Because if you're going to give it to a million other people, hundreds of hundred millions of other people, then you better make sure it works. So that, that's what a double double blind study. And when, we, so when I say experiment, an experiment is one in some some study in which a a change is introduced into the to the what you're observing. Okay, so so let's look at, let's define these things. Uh, ordinal data. Data. that can be arranged in order. Yeah, the measurement, their time, their finishing time, or uh, their height. If we want to put them in order, we'll put the highest to lowest, or lowest to highest. Uh, so, so it's data that can be arranged in a specific order, but it's different than nominal. But the differences can't be found or are meaningless. So it's data that can be arranged in an order, but their differences are, can't be dis discussed. So if we're looking at it for speed, yeah. Or who's got the best free throw average? All these players are all 17 feet tall. And so who has the best? So you look at how many attempts they have versus how many completions they make. So that is ordinal. Nominal categories only. If you you nominalize something, you put it in categories. The data cannot be arranged in an order. Again, nominal. It's categories only. The data cannot be arranged in an order. Example. 
soup cans at Tom Thumb or a store. They're, if you notice, they're made by different companies, but they're all the same size. We're almost there. So soup cans, uh, boxes of cereal. You can't put them in any order. You can put them in alphabetical order, but it's it's a categories. You have sweet peas. Do you have green beans? You have so that's how you organize your 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 uh, your layout there. Ratio. has a natural zero and a terminal 100 it consists can be anything, any number in between. So has a natural zero? Has a natural zero. So if we're looking for how many students are shorter than three feet tall, it's, it's, there aren't any in this room. There aren't any people under three feet tall. So there's a natural zero. 100, we mean by 100%. So the ratio is we, you, we can have none of the objects in our study satisfying what we're looking for, or we have 100%. And anything else between there has to exist. Why is that important? You ever hear the expression, I'm 300% positive? or I'm a thousand percent sure. What does that mean? Mathematically, it's impossible. You cannot have more than 100%. Because remember what we talked about yesterday, the, what, what a per, the formula for percent is? Part over total times 100. That equals a percent. So with, with just by going into the basic idea of things, can the part ever be bigger than the whole? Nope, it can only be as big. The best it could be is as big as the whole. It can never be bigger than the whole because then it wouldn't be a part of it. What about like those that are... Okay, now... Now you're looking at comparing two different things. You can have an increase of more than 100%. Because what we're looking at there is if we went from 0 to 10 the first try, and then we went from 0 to 20 the second try, this is now a 100% increase than this one. So this is 200%. This is 100%. Because now we're comparing two different things here. They're related to each other. There's an answer there. So it's 100% increase from last time. So where we are now and where we're last time. Good question. I'm glad you asked that. An interval. Uh, interval. The differences. between the elements are noticeable and meaningful but unlike ratio there is no zero as a starting point.
and no meaningful ratios. An interval. Okay, you can't take a ratio of that because in order to find a ratio, you have to have a part over total or a number over another number. You can't do that with intervals. The next chapter, we're gonna we're gonna take data and we're gonna put them in intervals. An interval is a way you separate your entire data set so that there are equal number of chances to fit in each specific group. They all have to be the same size. So that's why you can't take ratios in this thing. You can't have a, a starting point of zero. Yes, you can have an interval of zero to 10, 11 to 20, 21 to 30. You can have that, those are intervals, but does it have to start at zero? Because if we, if we were measuring the heights of, of students, where would we start? What would we, we wouldn't put zero feet tall. We'd have that entire uh, element, the range is gonna be wasted by it. So we'd start off, if we're looking at height, we look at say four feet, four feet to five feet, five feet to six feet. Those are intervals. They have no meaningful ratios. They don't have to start at zero. And the differences between them are noticeable and meaningful. They tell us about this group. Intervals define groups. Any questions? They define, yeah, because if we're looking at uh, heights of students, this is, if there are four people here, then we know that these four people belong in this group of tall people. And so, so it forms its own curve, I mean, its own groups. Nominal level of measurement. Here, the data only consists of names, labels, descriptions, um, attributes. This is she just said attributes or the uh, categories. Now, in nominal level of measurements, can you arrange them? No, you cannot. You can group them, but it would mean the same, but we can't arrange them. Okay, ready to look at this example. Here are examples of sample data of nominal level of measurement. The survey responses, responses of yes, no, or undecided. Are they nominal? Do they satisfy our condition? Yeah, they could be categories. They're labels, that's, that's how you answered it. Can you arrange them? 
Uh, you, you could put all the S's together, you could put all the notes together, but that's not, I mean, that's just grouping them. So you can't really do that. Okay, remember what I said about what coded means. Coded, again, what that means is when you take qualitative data and you assign it values to, for quick reference. So any students that said, yes, we're gonna call them one. Any students who said no, we'll call them zero. Any students that's undecided, we'll call them two. That way, when we look at the numbers now, it'll tell us more of how many students said yes, how many students said no. It, it allows us to move the numbers around and, and look at things better. So here, for an item in a survey, respondents are given choice of responding answers in the coded and the following. I agree, call that one. I disagree, call it two, I don't care, three. Why? Because it's a lot easier to move numbers one, two, and three than all those words. It'll take less space in your sheet. <laughs> Go away, don't bother me. Number five. So. Um, let's look at ordinal. These are data that can be arranged in some particular order. But differences between the data cannot be determined. The, op, the, the tricky word there is differences. What does it mean, differences? That's you think. Same, is there another, de is another definition of difference? I think mathematical. Subtraction. What this one means. So in other words, yes, we have ordinal levels of measurement. We have ordinal data. They're numbers. But they cannot be subtracted. Here's one example. Remember, an A equals four points. A B equals three points. C equals two. So if you had an A and a C, does that mean you have a C average? So it's four minus two. No, you can't do that. You'd have to add these two, which are four points plus two points, and you get a B. So you, you cannot find differences. You cannot subtract ordinal data because the values that they're associated are not numeric values as we use them. In Excel, if you're going to do any calculations, you have to make sure your column is as a number. If you put it as a text, can you add and subtract? No. In general, it works, but you have to make sure you define the column of data in Excel as numerical.
Let's see. So with this, we can compare the data relatively. Ordinal data only does relative comparisons. What does that mean? What is a relative comparison? Hmm? Well, yeah, well, you, you can compare them. Are they the same or not? Uh, is an A, is, is, is a four the same as a three? No, one's an A, one's a B. So we, we can compare them like that. But when we say magnitudes, those are calculations. It's comparison, right? Because we can only compare what they mean. If you have a B or a C or, or a four or a three, comparing what they really what they refer to. Okay, let's look at an example of ordinal. Here's an example of a simple data at the ordinal level of measurement. Course grades, college professor assigns grades A, B, C, D, or F. These grades be, can be arranged in order, but we can't determine the differences between the grades. We know that A is bigger than B, but we cannot subtract B from A. Even if we quantify them, we can't. Remember we say that A is four, B is three, we can't subtract them. We cannot do mathematics on them per se. All right. And the next one is the interval level of measurements. So these can be arranged. So this data group can be arranged in order. And the differences between data values can be found. May I ask you a question? Yes. What, what, what much difference is when you explaining the the measurements versus when we just went through all the classified data values, different. They're on the same. These are the okay. These levels of measurements are the class the the, the classifications. Because oh, remember, there there are four yeah. classes. We have the ordinal, nominal, uh, right. ratio, and this these these are just examples of what they oh, mean. Yeah, the definitions yeah. and examples of means. So what does it mean? And differences can be found. We can subtract them. We can find the differences between the two values. Let's look at this example. Body temperature. That's an interval because remember, temperatures are in intervals. It's either 97 to 97.9, 98 to 98.9. And we can do mathematics between them. If a patient is has a 98.2 degree temperature in the morning and the afternoon is 98.8, what's the change? So we take 98 
0.8 minus 98.2, we get a 0 0.6 degree change. But we have to say, is it a positive or negative? This is the AM, this is the PM. Yeah, so it's a 0.6 degree increase in temperature. And that usually happens. Your, your degrees, your body temperature changes during the day. Why? Because you're using it. Temperature is a relative to amount of heat. The more you move, the more heat you produce. When you're asleep, you're, you do nothing. And most of us breathe through our mouths most of the night. So it's cold air coming in. So, and years, we can figure out the number between years. Between 1776 and 1492, we can know exactly how many numbers of years. And it means something to us. So in interval data, yes, we can find differences, but the differences have a meaning. They have a purpose for taking the differences. And the last level of measurement are the ratios. The ratio level of measurement. These data elements can be arranged in any order Their differences can be found and the differences have a specific meaning. My example for that one. Actually, can you think of any examples here off the top of your head? Yeah. Because they, once you do youngest to oldest, then we can put them in and find out the ratio. How many how many students are in this group? I mean, we can rearrange them, right? Okay, that's a good one. Here are the examples. The natural zero. In ratios, we have a natural zero. Twice and three times are meaningful ratios. Or those are called quantifying quantifying agents. They're, they're giving a, a numeric value to an operation what we're doing to data. If I say twice, what does that mean? Two times whatever that data is, whatever that value is. If I say half, so these are just two words. There's you can use any of those words to describe a mathematical either expansion or constriction. Heights of students between 180 centimeters and 90 centimeters for high school students can be, and a preschool student, <laughs> zero centimeters, 180 is twice as tall as 90, right? So we, we can quantify, we can have meaning in any of those numbers that we get on there. And can we, we can do calculations with them. We can find the difference between them. So the length of class times, 50 minutes versus 100 minutes. The number of days in a week, 
how many days something is out. So those are examples. Oh, let me see. There's something here. The ratio test. is used to determine if a quantified magnitude makes sense. Okay, it's not remember ratio is you can do numbers, you can do calculations on it. If I say if I have a number of say 30 and I say twice 30, does that make sense? Well, if we're saying that if I have 30 grades now and I'm expecting twice as many, I'm expecting 60 grades. Does that make sense? Yeah. So, yes. So that is a ratio test. If you could quantify or put twice, thrice, half, well, fourth, anything like that, if, once you, if you can do that and it still is, has a meaningful solution, if the number at the end is still meaningful, then it's a, then, then it's a, a solid ratio test. Uh, it's, it's a ratio level. So we use the ratio test to see if it makes sense. Because if if we can't let's say um, it's an example of something that's not makes sense that way. Will it even make sense if the um, if the well, you can't have a negative in ratios because it has to be a relationship between what you have and what you're comparing it to. It will be, it could be a positive or negative, whether it's increase or decrease, but the ratio itself has to be a positive number. Oh, letter grades. If I double an A, what do I get? If I double a C, what do I get? So get, I get two C's. <laughs> so it doesn't make sense. So that's not a ratio number. It's just not quantifiable. So that's what the ratio test is all about. Now we look at um, I wonder if this is from calculations we were going to talk about yesterday. But we didn't get a chance to. Let's do this one first. Distinguish between ratio level and inter interval level. For each of the following, determine whether the data we are, are at the ratio level of measurement or the interval level of measurement. Times, minutes, it takes students to complete a statistics test. Body temperature of statistics students. What test do we use to see if it's a ratio or not? The ratio test. Time in minutes, it takes students to complete a statistics test. So if one student finishes in 20 minutes and I, and I do twice that, does that mean the next student will do 40 minutes? No, because the next student can finish in less time. So the comparison here, if I do the, the, the twice or three times, student A completes it in 20 minutes and the student B finishes in twice as many minutes, uh, that's not really a true statement, as opposed to body temperature. 
Because this one here, you're looking at too many students. It's plural. So what you have here, it's an interval because you have students who, who finish at the test in zero to 10 minutes, 11 to 20 minutes. We can group them like that. So those are intervals. Body temperatures, yes, they're, they're intervals already, but since it's the same person, we need the body temperature. Can you double the body temperature? <laughs> no. So does the ratio test pass for this one? And twice? Does it fail for this one? Yeah, this one ratio test. So that means this is a ratio and this is an interval. You have to ask yourself, if I double it, will it make sense? You can't double 98.6 degrees. If you double it, what happens? <laughs> You're fried. You're a crispy critter. So, and in test times, you can double it twice that much. So it is possible to double a student's score. Will all students finish in 10 minutes? No. Some finish in 10 minutes, some 20 minutes, some 30 minutes, some 40 minutes. But body temperature, you can't do that to it. So far so good? So if you're asked to see whether it's a ratio or an interval, do the ratio test and just pick an example and see if it makes sense. Yeah, if you look at temperature, if I, if I did twice the temperature, I'd be dead. So that's not legit. Yesterday, we talked about the law of numbers. The larger set of data you have, the more accurate your study is going to be. I cannot say anything about Mountain View students by simply asking you guys a few questions because the sample is too small. Now we talk about big data. When you've heard it before, big data, companies are using big data. What does that mean? Give me an example of a large sample. More. More. <laughs> I'm talking about like, like large data would be in the hundreds of millions and billions. This is big data. Stuff that we couldn't do, we need to have supercomputers to run it for us. Uh, NASA looking at the stars and figuring out how many of them are ret retreating, how many of them are succeeding in size. Subsidy size. So when we talk about big data, we're talking about data sets that are large and complex so that their analysis cannot be done or is beyond the abilities of traditional software. Like Excel. When we talk about big data, we're talking about the analysis can only be done by a number of large computers working in parallel.
what does working in parallel mean? Side by side. Yeah, because we have two types. We have sequence or parallel. In sequence, you have computers working like this. In parallel, you have computers working like this. So in parallel, you, all the computers are working at the same time. They're working at different things at the same time. And then once they finish, they spit it out and the, re, the results get combined together and it goes up to the conclusion. Large corporations used to have their computers, their IT systems set up in sequence. The problem with this is if what happens here is, is this, is you run through it. This is the computer that's working. It's processing all your stuff. These two are down. But if this one breaks, this one takes over. So, that, but now with this one being down, unless you have a way of circumventing this, your data gets stuck here. With parallel, you could, you can have these two down and only work everything to this one. And if this one breaks, you can just reroute it. So ideally, only time you want things in sequence is like if you're purifying water. You want all your filters to be one after the other. So that if this filter cleans, once this one gets full, then it goes in this one. Then it goes in this one. Then once this one gets dirty, you replace all three of them. So, but with this thing, his, if big data is calculated in real time with multiple computers, all doing the same stuff with different large bits of data. Let's look at some words here. Terabyte. <laughs> Petabyte. Exabyte, Zetabyte, and so that's one, yeah, Yoda. These are huge. Yes. Well, actually, let, let me go back to where we were in the past. Before terabyte, we had gigabyte. Then we had megabyte. <coughs> but then we had kilobyte. Then we just had a byte. And then before that, we had a bit. This is the evolution of computers. A bit is just one small piece of information. A byte in the old days used to have four bits. Then they went to eight bit. Then went to 16 bits, 32, 64 bits, 128. So in other words, each byte gets bigger. The bigger the bite gets, the more stuff can be done. And the thing about it, the reason they use those words is because it, it's exactly what you eat. But this, another name for this bit was called a nibble. Because it's a small nothing. Here's a little nibble. And then the bites started getting bigger, which means more information could be processed. More of the sandwich can be eaten at one time. Kilo. There's a thousand bytes. So could you, could you distribute a byte of continuous data? 
a byte. A byte is like a letter. If you if you're typing a word in, in on the screen, a byte is only the first a, a letter that you're typing in there. I was trying to imply to what you went over. If you had mentioned something about digital being infinite. Yes. Well, these are different parts of it. Oh. This is now we're getting to because we're now talking about big data. We're not talking about in, is super large pieces of data, what it really means. What, what do we mean? Because what we're looking at here is, let's say that the bit is us standing on the earth. The byte is our city. The kilobyte is our state. Megabyte is our nation. Gigabyte is our world. Terabyte is our solar system. Petabyte byte is our galaxy and then it goes bigger from there that's the size of increase we're talking about each step let me put these numbers on there a terabyte is 10 to the 12 bits of data <coughs> okay 10 to the 12th looks like this one two three Four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve. That's how big it is. That's how many bits of information I can have. A petabyte, a byte is ten to the fifteenth bits of information. You notice what? Uh, well, I'll do a couple more, and I'll show. I'll show you exactly how big this is. What do you think the next one's going to be? 18. We have to add three. Ten to the twenty-one, ten to the twenty-four. This is how many bits of information are being processed at every one second of time on these computers. Right now, we have stuff running it in gigabits. We have. A hard drives that can save terabits of information, but not process that fast. Look at these are big computers. These are the ones that the military uses, the government uses. Uh, probably NASA uses these. The CIA. Now, what, what I'm talking about is each one of these zeros, each one of these zeros means it's 10 times bigger. So to go from this zero to here, I multiply by 10, by 10, by 10. So from here to here, that's a thousand times bigger. A thousand times bigger. So from this one, from, from a terabyte to this one, we've increased it by 12. Well, that's 4,000 times, that's 1,000 times 1,000 times 1,000 times 1,000 times bigger. It also shows how not interested you guys are in this stuff. <laughs> so the thing is, is how much energy does each one of those? Oh, well, these computers? Yeah. In the old days, when computers were first built and they turned them on, this is back in the 40s and 50s and 60s. They would turn on the computers and city blocks would dim. Lights and electricity would go away in city blocks. That's how much electricity was needed. And then these computers were only powerful enough to maybe add a couple of numbers. Then, then it progressed to you had you, the computer systems now have to be in air conditioned rooms. 
they have to have pure oxygen. Air has to be circulated in there all the time. Clean air. The, the floors are three feet off the ground because they have air conditioning units and filters cleaning the air all the time. It's got to be at 65 degrees because if those air conditioners ever quit, that room would superheat, I mean, in no time at all. Uh, I, I took a tour of the trains, the train, the, what's that train station in, in Fort Worth? The, not the station, but the company. The New Mexico, Pennsylvania, steel, the train, whatever that big train system you see. Fine. They are more secure than Fort Knox. They have, if you walk in their computer room, you, you walk into this room and their entire computer lab is probably a, a size of a football field. It's dug into the ground about 20 feet. They have like five foot thick walls around it. And the windows on the very top have steel uh, shutters that can slide in case of a, a, a war. And their mainframe system is literally like 80 feet underground in this huge, massive bunker that's so, it's so thick. They wouldn't tell us how thick the, the concrete and steel walls were that they had to keep it secured. Because if, if that system would ever go down, all the trains, anything that's on rails in the United States would crash. There would be no control of them. So yeah, talk, that talk about needed security that way. Yes, you need those. So the amount of electricity, they need their own power plants. Google has its own generating station just for its buildings. It's so big, it's so powerful. And I think about Google. How many people in the world use Google for anything? And yeah, so that's going worldwide. And there's just there's there's 7 billion people. Let's say half of them don't have computers. So it's 3.5 billion. And out of those, let's say half of those, so you're still looking at 1 billion people at any time using your computers. It's just amazing how much electricity. Yeah. It, yeah. Well, th those companies usually have their own power sources. They have their own uh, solar cell arrays to get uh, energy in there. All of Google buildings have solar cells on top of them to help offset the amount of use of electricity. But you're right. Is if you want to mess up the world, just throw a wrench in one of those things and see what happens. What? Well, they're getting cheaper and cheaper. It used to be. I mean, you can make your own. It's Okay, off the topic here, but yes, what those mean is if you buy your own or make your own, it's not really that hard. All it is is take welding and put the, these strips and positive negative on these cells. But if you have somebody else give it to you for free, you cannot get money back for the electricity your cells produce. Back in the old days, back in the 1990s and early 2000s, when solar cells were first being used, people had those on their houses and anything that would they wouldn't wouldn't use it would go back into the into the grid into the grid I said grid <laughs> into the grid and they would get paid for it. So these companies that offer you free solar cells to put on your house, yes, they'll give you free solar cells. But anything that that you make extra that goes back in the grid, they get the money for it. So it's not free. You're losing thousands of dollars a year on this possibly. Especially now, since we had all these heat waves and no no rain, I mean, think of how much you have, and they're not that expensive. What's expensive is if you want to have your battery cells. If you want to save the energy, that's where it gets expensive. Tesla has some good batteries, generate backup backup batteries. That what happens is you save your electricity saves there, energy saves there. Is when you get a blackout, it automatically switches over and it uses straight from battery cells. And they, you can run your entire house. Steve Gates has it that way. He's not hooked up to any public power source. His house is all independent, off the grid. So, Bill Gates, I'm not going to say Steve Jobs, but Bill Gates. Yeah, yeah. But yeah, so 
yeah, don't don't get fooled by those free things because if it sounds too good to be true, it is too good. Buy your own, go into debt, but you'll get it back in in spades. But the thing is, you, you'll get more money back, and you don't have to put a whole array up there first. You can put four or five up there first, and every month buy another one, put it up there, and just get another line going out. And then you build it in pieces and stages. But yeah, it's, it's expensive if you don't do it at, all at once. It's super expensive. Uh, there is there is a a center not far from here that's run by the state of Texas, where they test all these technologies for solar power houses, smart houses, greenhouses. I forgot where it's located. It's in it's near near Dallas. And they research all this stuff. If you want to know anything about solar cells and greenhouses and stuff, they'll, and I went, I walked through it with one of my classes many years back, but I'll, I'll get the information for you. And so I strongly suggest you take a tour through there. They have it anytime they have the, the state fair come through, they bring a mobile unit of this thing, but it's, it's amazing what's up there. And again, as, as a first world nation, we're like so far behind the grid. N Netherlands, uh, Finland, Europe, they've been there, they've been greenifying their environments for, for so many decades now. No. Uh, let me see what else I want to talk about. I'll talk about no, 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 no. Missing ooh, ooh, yeah, missing data. Yes. Can you ignore missing data? Why not? Right. It makes it inaccurate. And that's why like, in medical charts, if you're, if you're a nurse and the patient is in there for critical care, you, your job is to make sure that at certain times during the day, the, the BS, BMI data is given, the temperature, the blood pressure, all sorts of stuff. The, the oxygen rate, because all this stuff is recorded and analyzed to see, is this medication working? If it's not working, they want to see it. And how, do you, how can you tell it's not working? Well, from the, from the last temperature test, oxygen absorption, it was this. Is it going up? Is it going down? So never, ever, ever ignore missing data. It's, it's a tough choice on whether you delete that entire level of data for that person or that, that object you're studying, or do you just put something in there as a, as a holder? Exactly, yeah. So those are the tough choices that have to be made. And if, if you have a lot of people that have missing data, you, it's, it's so far gone that you may have to restart. But it's not the same when it comes to like human beings in a hospital. You replace that data as fast as possible. Once you notice it's missing, try to replace it as fast as possible, if it's possible. If not, then you look at the entire data for if it's morning temperature you're missing, look at all the morning temperatures, see if there's a pattern there. Because anomalies don't usually just spike up or down. There's usually a, a set pattern of people. So. Um, don't, don't, don't ignore that. So what's, a, okay, last thing, what's a biased result? When I say, when I say bias, what does bias mean? No, not in this case, it won't mean that. Okay. Actually, in, 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 in that context, it means the opposite. Is if, you, if you're in bias of something, you're in favor of something. But bias, it just means that it's... Affecting the value or values of a study... It's affecting the values of a study 
either in favor or in detriment to. The object. Well, we're going to look at next chapter when we start graphing our data. A type of bias we look at is called skewness. You ever hear that word? Something skewed? This is what it's supposed to look like. This is what we call normal. Normally distributed data. And we're gonna go in, into depth in this next chapter, next couple of chapters. You ever hear of a bell curve? That's what this is looking at. What it says here is right in the middle of this whole thing, this is at 50% of the data. This is at 100%. This is at 0%. What it says is at the 50% mark, if everything's like it's supposed to be, the highest point is supposed to happen at the 50% mark. And then it tapers off equally both directions. Now, when we talk about skewness, something like this that's called skewed right. because we took away these guys. We have affected, in essence, we've affected the right-hand side. So what would this one be? Yeah, because all the data is packed over to one side. So now this right-hand side is now affected negatively. That's what happens if you have a biased data set. If it's, if it's supposed to be normally distributed, your data, you touch it, everything was perfect. But if by that one or two or three people didn't answer their surveys correctly, you could have just skewed the data now. You made it a bias it influenced the, it, the judgment one way or the other. Um, yeah, so with missing data, we have three options. We can delete that data, the whole data set, We can impute, which means substitute the value with some value that makes sense using using some method of you think you can look at average of all their earlier test scores or anything like that. It's an M I M P U T impute. Delete, impute, or, oh, nothing. Ignore it. This is never a good idea. Because anytime you do a statistical study, you have to answer 
for all of the numbers, all, all the data numbers and all of the calculation numbers you come up with. So if you have a lot of data, deleting that line of data wouldn't, wouldn't affect it much. Or just not use it in your data set. Impute it means substitute it with a value that a logical value that based on previous uh, observation of, the, of that, that event. All right. So that covers those. We have one more section. Oh, that's what I was talk about. Yeah, that, that does it for section two. From section one, our questions yesterday were dealing with percentage to decimal, decimal percent. And what if we had a conversion from a fraction to a percent? So this symbol means per cent. A dollar is made up of how many cents? So it means per 100. So the symbol percent is the same thing of one over a hundred. Thirty six percent is remember the percent symbol is the same thing as one over a hundred. So since I divided by 100, the number of zeros tells me the number of decimal places I move my decimal to the left. No. The number of zeros on the bottom tells us the number of spaces Our decimal moves left. The number of, I'm sorry, number of zeros on the bottom tells us the number of spaces our decimal moves left. So since percent symbol means one over a hundred, that means the percent means move our decimal move our decimal number two to the left. So what would that be in decimal? Our number is right here like this right now, and that's one over a hundred, right? That's what that means. We have two zeros on the bottom. So that means move the decimal two to the left. So it equals 0 0.0025. Yeah, so don't get fooled if, they, if there's a decimal in front of it or not. It's just, if it's a percent, move the decimal two to the left. So from, from percent to decimal, move two spaces 
left. That's the first rule. It's just the opposite. Now, if I'm going from decimal 2%, what do you think I do there? Move two spaces right and place the percent symbol. So what is 2.4 in percent? Yeah, so I have 2.4, I move it two to the right. So it's 240 and put a symbol percent behind it. Zero point zero two three. What is that in percent? Two point three percent. Because I'm going from decimal to percent, so I move it two to the right. What's really happening is this. What's really happening is this. Multiply by 100 and place the percent. If I'm going from decimal to percent, multiply the decimal number by 100 and put a percent symbol behind it. A couple of examples here. Four over five. Do we have a decimal? So the first thing you have to do is find the decimal. So does five go into four? No. So we put a decimal there. Does five go into 40? How many times? So this equals 0.8. Yeah, you take a fraction to decimal and then multiply this by 100. So that the 100, because there's two zeros there, it moves the decimal two spaces to the right and put us the symbol behind it. Same as three fourth, three over four. Now three over four is, well, let's, let's do this. Does four go into three? No, so I put a decimal up there, I put a zero down there. Does four go into 30? How many times? Seven times four is 28. Subtract that, I get two plus zero. Four goes into 20. So it's 0.75. This is long forgotten by students because of calculators. 
And you, and you guys are looking at this thing, it's wow, it's like, y'all used to do that? <laughs> and we're, we're, we're <laughs> exactly, yeah. So now converting this, multiply this number by 100, which means move the decimal two to the right, one, two, and put a percent symbol behind it. And there's your answer. Now, the question that was asked yesterday, what about one divided by three? What is that percent? <laughs> no, it's 33%. Well, I'll show you how to get it. So we know that this answer is 0 0.3333. Or it would be like that. Does everybody know where I got 0.333 from? Three, does three go to one? No. So I'll put a dot. Does three go to 10? Three times. Subtract those. I got one. It's never ending. It's always going to be the same. So it's a never ending thing. So because this number repeats with only one digit, We know that it was, we'll say n is 0.3333 forever. If we took n and multiplied it by 10, what do we get? We get, move it over one. So it gets 3.333 forever. So far, so good. What happens if we take 10n and subtract 1n from it? What do we get? No, no. It's like <laughs> apples and oranges. If I had 10 apples, you take away the apples. You say, you're, <laughs> that's the way we, you could get away all the apples. <laughs> yeah. If I took away, if I had 10 apples and took away one apple, I have nine apples left. Let's see this. So 10n is 3.333 and forever minus 0 0.3333 forever. If I subtract those, what do I get? Three. Because these cancel. So N is three over nine because I divide both sides by nine. And so that equals 0.33. So how do we do this now with percent? So this is how we convert infinite decimals into numbers. We do the same thing here. Since n equals 0.333 infinitely, we take it and multiply by 100. Now, is it 33.33% or is it 33.3%? We look at the rounding rule. Does everybody remember the rounding rule? Yeah, if it's between zero and four, just drop it. If it's between five and nine, add one. But the question is, rounding to which number? Is it the first decimal? Is it the second decimal, third decimal, fourth decimal? Let's say we're rounding to the first decimal. We're rounding to the first decimal. So our number is 33.33. Since we're rounding to the first decimal, we need the number right after it. 
That's the first decimal is this one. So is this one is between zero and four, right? So since it's zero, four, I just drop it. So my answer is 33.3%. But they, they don't want that because even 0.3 is too tough. So what they say here is, one over three is approximately 33%. Yeah, so if you have those infinite decimals, remove those decimals and just round it to the integer, the last integer. Now, which is how come, whenever you do things mathematically, if you're doing calculations, multiply by the fraction one third. Because one third is more accurate than 0.33. Because 0.33 are 33%. I'm missing infinite number of numbers. So this is more accurate than the rounded version. And that's what we called a round off error. It all depends on if we have numbers that go on forever and we round it up. <laughs> I thought you had Tourette's there for a second. <laughs> but yeah, that's what I want to show. We're going to pick up this now from uh, next uh, tomorrow's class will be we'll finish up this first chapter and then we'll start on friday we'll start chapter two because remember i'm getting my face drilled on monday no at root canals it's not necessarily is how long did it hurt those things can happen anytime it's what happened is they can happen um 